Hello, Ryan. Hello, Rachel. How how are you? I am doing my duty <laughs> and my honor. Did you know that we live for the one and we in fact die for the one? Yeah, I I did. I did hear that a, a little bit. The only way I know if you actually the did place. the only way I know you actually do know that is if you could repeat it several times during our discussion. Yeah, yeah, cuz you know you know the thing about having a motto mm-hmm. is you say it all the fucking time. I'm not hearing you say it. We die for the one we live for the one. You got it. Almost. You gotta you gotta flip some stuff around. Come on, come on, flip um, it around, flip it around. We live, die, we die live. <laughs> we live, die, repeat, Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt. No. Come on, Rachel. We live. Uh, come on, we can do this. You've been podcasting for years now. We live. Mm-hmm. We We die. Close. You gotta you gotta get some words in between. We live for Come on. Rachel, we're not the thing. No, we're not going to get there. Maybe by the end of this discussion, we'll get Rachel to get it correct. <laughs> we live for the one, we die for the one. Whoa! I I almost thought you got it correct, but Rachel, you're actually wrong. Uh, we yum for the one. We yum yum for the one. That's that's the real uh, motto that we use on this podcast. But why yum yum, Rachel? Everyone is licking their lips, throwing their hair back, and accepting their Academy Awards, but they don't know why yum yum is the name. <laughs> Rachel is breaking at me doing it like that for once. That's a, that's a new variant of me asking you why the title. Give us the reason. Oh, you. What was that? You. You, my lovely husband. Who I, I deeply care for. We are married. She's not lying. T- t- totally, totally don't consider violence. Uh, named this podcast, uh, the one that we do together, after a moment in Star Trek Discovery where an individual said yum yum and it made no sense. Uh, came across a little horny, a little sexy. A little silly, definitely. Yes. A little goofy, perhaps, but definitely not Star Trekky in that moment. It was. No! It was more Killjoys, if anything else, or more Farscape, if anything else. But no. I did, I did love that line. As did you. Don't, don't, don't undersell yourself. You had such a strong reaction to when that it line happened. It was not love. It was. It was not love. You, you have kind of um, sort of Stockholm syndrome to me into mm-hmm. in- enjoying it. Or and as B5 would call it, Helsinki syndrome, Jew. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but today we are not here to suffer alone. We are talking about Babylon 5, episode by episode, movie by movie, bit by bit. Not all of it. We're not going to do Crusade or the comic books or books or any of that, but we are- I still want to do a mini episode on the Marcus story. What? What? I read that. What What are you talking about? I, I don't recognize any short story written by JMS years after the fact that completely ruins the ending of a great character. Uh, I'm not I'm not paying Sleeping attention to that. Sorry, I can't hear you, Rachel. Shows I'm too busy time. letting everyone know that we are talking about a Babylon 5 movie, but we are not alone. We are joined by a fellow ranger, a ranger of uh, our soul, a ranger who knows the motto, knows the credo of this podcast, uh, a, a, a ranger who is a ba- uh, who's also someone who has seen some Babylon 5 thanks to this podcast, but a ranger who's also a podcaster. We are joined by Luke of Continuum Drag. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. Do you, do you want to say the motto now? Or do you want to do say Do you want me to say the motto? I also have to say the motto. <laughs> You're do you on want the, the pod- one for the podcast or do you want the one for the uh, show? I called you a ranger. So I called I you think- a ranger, so do your duty. <laughs> do it. Oh, my God. I want to do what Rachel did and just uh, defer as long as possible. <laughs> Well, 
Hey, as this, I believe it is. Fi- this film shows that you can do the same trick twice. Nobody expects it. It's true. Nobody sees it coming. <laughs> like, I believe it is. I live for the one. I die for the one. You believe it, or do you know it? The well, film could have said it a couple it, more that's times. For sure. <laughs> I definitely don't believe it. I have many questions about this motto. Luke, tell us a bit more about yourself. Let us know who you are, where you're from, all of that jazz. Tell us about your podcast. Oh, absolutely. Uh, We've done a podcast before, a couple of them now, actually. But my podcast, Continuum Drag, I do with my co-host, Jordan. We watch old science fiction, fantasy, sometimes some like spooky stuff, whatever, whatever sort of falls in that weirdo genre for TV and uh, we've watched a whole bunch of series, a whole bunch of TV movies, too many at this point. We're, we're so deep into it now. I can't even get my brain clear because it's just, it's just got so much knowledge about bad, bad TV. It's uh, too much, if anything. But yeah, we've been doing that for a few years. It's uh, been a lot of fun. And uh, we're on a little break right now. So I've been able to come out here and join the Yum Yum crew for our adventures with the Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, with the rangers thank you they're not any rangers they're the rangers now what kind of uh shows or movies have you guys gotten up to over the years for everyone out there listening who may not be familiar with your with your back catalog what would you regale people with if they haven't heard of your podcast and you're trying to get them to uh check you out what are what are your what are your top hitters where you say oh yeah I, I, we've we've done this thing and this thing and this thing. Oh, the big hits? Well, we've done Sliders, we've done Sequest DSV. I know one of your favorites, Space Above and Beyond, we've done. There's uh and then we kind of got gone, gone into some like weirder, more um esoteric stuff. We've watched a British show, which I brought it up. I don't remember the name of it. Uh Ultraviolet, there we go. About vampires in Britain and a secret uh church police that hunts them. That was pretty good, actually. Uh so there's a there's a real mix of stuff that you can kind of find um really like popular ones, Earth 2, for example, or really, really weird, unpopular ones, say uh, Auto Man from the 80s. Although that you know what, people are fans of Auto Man. We get some comments about Auto Man. Well, where do I look? You don't. I'm gonna feed it straight into you. What? I'm in the movie. No, the movie's in you. Look, Otto, uh, I've got to go, all right? Uh, I'll be back. Now, we have to get to the beast in the room. Not an elephant, it's a monster. It's all. It's almost like a hand, in fact. And, Rachel, we have <laughs> finished Babylon 5. We did all of the episodes, all like 110 episodes, one by one by one by one by one by one, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, And you don't want to do Crusade, but you decided that we, yeah, we're going to cover the two direct-to-VHS slash DVD (laughs) movies. I like to think they're VHS. Well, this one was on the Sci-Fi channel, so... This isn't a straight-to-video uh, release, so get your facts right, uh, Okay, Rachel. the non-TNT. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, get it correct. Yes, and what one are we talking about today? Uh, is it is it Lost Tales? Is that what we're doing today? N- no. Is it Third Space? I heard that there was a space that the evil aliens lived in in this movie, and I'm sure it was Third Space. Is that the movie? We did that one. Are we doing the original cut of The Gathering um, and not the TNT cut of The like, Gathering? Is that what we're doing? No, no. I think it was uh, Into the Starlight. No, I don't think that's right. Um, but that was the episode title that came up in to, the it was, font, didn't it? Uh, to Live and Die. Did I misread to it? To Live and Die in Starlight. But uh, uh, perhaps our guest, who again <laughs> is a ranger and knows the motto through and through, uh, will tell us uh, a bit about what we watched today. Luke, what did we all consume? Do you want the title or can I just read the summary? You can I do, do not it remember all. This show. You can this had do it all. three titles. It had three titles. It was like Babylon 5, um... 
Adventures of the Rangers, Legend of the Rangers, uh, Live and Die in Starlight. There might have been a third one, but maybe it was uh, We Live for the One, We Die for the One, underscore. There something in brackets, maybe. There were so many titles on this movie. <laughs> yes, there were. So we did, in fact, watch Babylon 5, Legends of the Rangers, Live and Die in Starlight, or whatever it is, because... Uh, we'll get into it, but give us the uh, synopsis of this. What does the description have to regale us with? All right. The Rangers, an order of warrior priests, have wandered the darkness between the stars for over a thousand years, protecting a hundred worlds from invasion and destruction. But now, a new alien threat appears on the event horizon of the Interstellar Alliance a force more ancient and powerful than anything previously encountered. The only obstacle in the way of this new race, a single, broken-down ranger ship under the command of David Martell, played by Dylan Neal, whose sole orders were to escort Ambassador Gakar... Did I get that right? No. Jakar. Jakar. I like Gakar. Jakar, thank you. You've met Jakar before, do you? Jakar. All right. Whose sole orders were to escort Ambassador Jakar. Oof. If I couldn't so- say, pronounce Jakar, wait till you hear this. Played by Andreas Katsoulis. <laughs> you got it right. Yeah. You got it right. Oh, great. He was to an fugitive. interstellar conference. <laughs> to an interstellar conference. Alone, barely armed, they must defeat an enemy unlike anything they have seen before. That was it. And I'm moved to tears, even. and But not on the outside. I'm crying on the inside where it counts. And what counts the most for our podcast, if you listen to it, you know this is true. There is nothing more important than this next segment. Rachel, you're the keeper of the keys for Yum Yum Energy, so please unlock it for us now so we can enter the bit of the show that everyone is truly here for. Yeah, so Ryan wasn't content with just naming the podcast after Yum Yum. He decided that we just had to integrate a little bit of Yum Yum in each episode. And with each show, it comes in a different form. And what is it for Babylon 5, Ryan? Yum Yum Energy. It's Yum Yum Energy, Y-Y-E. I coined that. Rachel was against it. She screeched and she screamed and she went overboard and said, no, we're not going to call it Y-Y-E or Yum Yum Energy. We're not going to call our listeners Yumlings. And here we are, years later, and Rachel not only has accepted it, but you've admitted that you, you, you love these little things. It's, it's fun. It's a fun thing to give our podcast a little bit of zest to it all. Mm-hmm. But Yum Yum Energy... What does that what does that entail, Rachel? What does that mean for the unlearned out there? It is a, a moment or or a, a character in general sometimes that within a given episode brings yum yum energy, which often means that they could have said yum yum. Uh, but in general means that they are Silly, giddy, little bit fun, maybe a little bit horny. And it's always out of the blue. Yes. And do you have anyone in Legend of the Range? Sorry, Babylon 5, Legends of the Ranges, Live and Die in Starlight? <laughs> Jakar is the easy answer, but he is far too enlightened to say yum yum. He does give kisses. He does give kisses. He does give kisses. Kiss, kiss, bye bye. Mm hmm. Yes, bye bye. The sequel to Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Last performance. It it is Andreas Katsoulis' last performance as Jakar, so you could give it as a as a very solemn yum 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 energy to him. It's his last chance to win it. Uh, yeah, but he's won it so much. He's won it so much. There was a line that I reacted to very strongly because it made no sense. Felt oddly horny, oddly sexual, and that was the Jack Rabbit line. Wow, you stole my answer. The lady, I don't remember, was her name Lucy? Sarah. Sarah, sorry. Sure, I'll take your word for it. (laughs) Rachel, 
I'll take your word for it. You're an expert. You're a ranger. And so she's complaining about having to go back into her, through her hole, down her tube, uh, to the, the f- firing area, which we'll get to, we'll unpack later. But she's like, <laughs> I'm beginning to feel a bit like a jackrabbit. In and out. In and out. In, in and, and out. out. In and out and of her hole. Like, yeah, that, that's an easy, like, penetrative sex joke. Yes. Easy. But did this special mean it? Or was that just by happenstance? I think it was just by happenstance. And it's just like, this is your job, bitch. What the fuck are you talking about? I give it to her as well, because she was the ranger that had a sleeveless outfit. Oh, that's why. Okay. And that was so absurd. (laughs) And then you realize they have an explanation for why she has a sleeveless outfit because she's going to need to use those arms. She's really going to need those sleeves. Would color coordinate the shirts underneath the vests for the break? Slow her down. Sleeves would slow her down. But I'm going to give an honorary mention to the lead psychic vision ghost guy that keeps haunting the ship. I think he could have said yum yum. The jaw drop. The jaw drop like, and the, oh, like, the fucked up fingernails. I think he could have said it when his jaw dropped on the floor and he could have let out a cartoon yum yum. Now, Luke, you're the guest here. So maybe as someone who has a bit of a, a further away relationship to Babylon 5, maybe you can come in and give us a perspective that maybe we're just too close to the canvas to see. So who, in your opinion, had YYE? Who could have said yum yum? I mean... In the tradition of Yum Yum coming out of nowhere and seeming out of place, I, you've already called it out. Jakar suddenly saying, kiss, kiss, love, love, goodbye. I was just like, what is, what is happening here? Why? <laughs> That's but Jakar. I will say, but I will say, I, I, would, I would put a second place, Sarah. I think you're on the money with Sarah. Not necessarily for a line she has, but that poor actress having to run the weapons by punching her little arms around. I was just like, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> the noise she made when she had to do it. Oh, no, the, I know the, she's making noises. The, the she scream does. got me. <laughs> it's a big scream, but I love the re- repetitious little wimpy grunts. <laughs> <laughs> now, imagine if those were yums. Yum, yum, yum. Now, that would have been fantastic television. <laughs> I have very little history of Babylon 5 other than I was aware of it. I knew it was out. It just wasn't something I ended up watching. I think we talked about this a little last time I was on. There was like very – on the very early days when Jordan and I were talking about maybe doing a podcast, there was there was a brief moment where it was going to be a Babylon 5 podcast, but it didn't it, – we ended up sh- shifting away from that. So uh, there, was a, there was a brief, brief shining moment. I might have watched all of Babylon 5, but uh, instead I've watched – I've watched The Sixth Sense, a 1970s show about a psychic doctor. It's pretty close. And this movie, no knowledge from you. Now, Rachel, we all know that you and I have watched Babylon 5 from back to front, but you have said on the podcast that you have not seen all of the movies. There are some, especially the later ones, that you, even if you have seen it, you have very foggy memory of. So tell us a bit about this one, Legend of the Rangers. I'm pretty sure I haven't seen it before. Pretty sure. (laughs) You've never seen this before. (laughs) Like, I don't think I would remember if I had. Um, But you have told me that I haven't. I believe that. Um, so... (laughs) How could you forget the guns? You would never forget that. Or the fat Drazi who only says his name in a very slow tone of voice because he's dumb. Uh, Yeah, that was a thing. Um, I had no interest in ever watching this. Uh, (laughs) I had more of a curiosity about Crusade, to be honest. Uh, Not that I ever want to watch that either. I didn't want to watch this. Uh, I cannot say that enough. So Um, so you loved it? (laughs) It was Bad in a way that I wasn't expecting, to be honest. And I think that was because I, in my um, 
What's the antonym for anticipation? Dread. Yeah, sure. uh, dread. <laughs> I'll go with dread. Um, Judge dread. Yes. Dread about watching this. I forgot or like didn't factor in how much of its shittiness would be because it's a pilot. Mm. It's designed not to just be a one and done story. This isn't And it's not with people that we know really. And unlike some of the TV movie pilots we've done, say, on this podcast, this definitely does not have the feel of, ah, oh, we could have just ended it here and you would have been fine. Like Space Above and Beyond's pilot episode. Not great, but it does have that layer of, oh, this could that's, just be on its own. That's and- not a movie that could also be a pilot. Yeah. That, like this. Yeah. Um, This is a pilot that became a movie. Yes, this is strictly just a pilot and we're here to watch it and then there's no show afterwards. Now... Of course I've seen this. I love Babylon 5 and I've gone out of my way through my life to watch as much, if not all of it. And this was one that was very difficult to get my hands on because the physical copy of it was not sold with the other movies. And I think that maybe just licensing stuff. This was, again, as mentioned, this was aired on the Sci-Fi channel and that's different to Warner Brothers and TNT and all of that. And... I eventually did find a copy to watch, and I remembered thinking that it was fine. I thought it was fine, like nothing to write home about, not offensive, just fine. I've seen worse television, and then literally the Lost Tales, which is the thing after this, is so bad to me that it that it just overshadows any of the negativity that I may have felt towards uh, Legend of the Rangers. Now, over the years, though, Legend of the Rangers has been the the kicking, uh, it has just been kicked around by the Babylon 5 fan base and community. Everyone takes pot shots at it. Everyone kind of agrees that it's garbage and shit. Rarely do you see people defend it. Now, you'll see people defend Crusade. You'll even see people defend the Lost Tales. But no one really tries with this. And it does have some iconically bad moments that are remembered for the fan base. But I was curious to see it again because we've had guests on this podcast who are lover, lovers of B5 say that they've gone out of their way not to watch it because it's reputation or they saw it and they said it was the worst use of their money or any of these things. And I just remember like every time I hear this, I'm kind of a bit puzzled because I'm just like, was it even that bad? Like, yeah, I remember it not being great, but like, was it really that awful? And then we sat down and watched it today. Haven't seen it since, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 years ago, like half my lifetime ago, probably. And sitting down today to watch it, you're not going to be surprised, listeners, our yumlings out there. Rachel wasn't a fan. I wasn't a fan either. Now, Luke, I imagine you were not a lover of this, but maybe you'll surprise us. What did you think of this? Because of my podcast, I've watched a lot of failed pilots very much in this vein. And I'm not going to say I love this by any means, but I, I don't know if it deserves like quite so much hate. It, it's worst sin is it's just like kind of a dull pilot. That's That's like the worst thing about it. It's not like I've seen far worse things and I've seen far better things. This one like is this one's right down the middle. I've, I it takes a lot of the same missteps I see in pilots. Just it just steps in a lot of holes it shouldn't. It just kind of has some problems and some of them have to do with it coming off of a larger series and some of it just has to do with just like maybe maybe not realizing the world that well. I I mean, I just think it's not terrible but it's also not great. It's it's biggest sin is just being kind of mediocre. <laughs> I would say I'll say that it, it fails, but not spectacularly and not in a way that's unique. The movies always just feel like an obligation. And that's how I feel about this one. This is no different to me than the others, except for this is clearly a pilot. Now, we've done a pilot for Babylon 5. It, it had its movie, The Gathering, but to compare it to The Gathering is 
very much unfair because the gathering was also not good, but not good in a very different way. And I wanted to throw it over to you again, Luke, because you said it, you've covered a lot of these type of things on your show. And that's definitely a reason why I wanted to pick your brain a bit about uh, this one in particular, because to you, you've had to go through this and you have like an understanding of like the pitfalls that the pilots can go down. And I just wanted to ask this straight up. Is this a thing made for adults or for children, in your opinion? Oh, it's made for adults for sure. I mean, maybe not like aiming for like high television, not golden age television or anything, but I I don't think it's made for children. Uh, I've watched a lot of things made for children and I can now tell the difference fairly clearly. I'll be honest, I think think just some of its bigger issues are... um, God, God bless the uh, gentleman. I believe it was Dylan Neal who's playing the lead. Um, I've seen people who do worse jobs at this trope, but he's kind of given the character of David Martell, and the character isn't much more than just kind of like handsome, a uh, handsome lead man. There's not a lot more to him. They don't give him any flaws. He's always right about everything. He's always kind of in the correct position. Like the closest he comes to kind of being wrong as he gets in a little bit of a fight with a, one of his rivals and then the, and the rivals kind of trying to be nice to him. But like he, he, he's never incorrect. He wins every fight. He's always on the right side of history. He's so he, it just, there's not much to him. It's kind of like, it, you know, you think you want your hero to be good, but like it makes him a bit dull as a result. Yeah, um, there's no I think Dylan is bringing more to no the character. Grit. It's just smooth. And that's dull. In, in in fairness to the character, on some s- small level, there is supposed to be these things you're saying, but there isn't a big enough degree of shift. So usually it's like, oh, in a story, he maybe does a 180 by the end of it. But no, in this, it's like he did four degrees. Like he was slightly weird and like he was slightly off in the beginning. Like he ran away, but he had good reasons to. And then by the end, he doesn't run away. But also, it's not much of a, like, it's just not much of a development there. And it's like, you know, you need to amp these things up. Like, actually make him a coward in the beginning would be a thing. And that's what you're saying, Luke. Like, he, there is no fault to him. Like, there's not even, like, it's not we just. We agree his, with him the whole way through. Yeah, it's not even like he's never incorrect. It's just he's never a flawed character. Yeah, that's kind of what makes a character interesting. And he just, it, I mean, I get it. It has to happen. I mean, I, you see it. There's one moment where there, I think Jakar says, you remind me of someone I met, the president of the galaxy. And I was just like, oh, cool. So like, it's, like this is what I mean. It's just like the, the writer's just like, did you like the other series and the other characters? Here's someone we are telling you is identical to the character you already like. I was just like. Uh, I mean, what I want to see is a new character, not the one I already like. <laughs> and he's nothing like Sheridan for a start either. But why I asked that kid question was, it's so interesting to me how much this felt like a Power Rangers type show. Just like you have this ragtag group and they have their like wacky uniforms and they're always constantly making these safe for children like quips and stuff and then maybe they have a little bit of a wink and nudge at adult themes and that's how I felt during this I was like what is the audience is what I was always going for because with the pilot they always like the ones that fail always fail at that too of like who are they aiming towards with the gathering for all of its faults it was very much aiming for like an adult sci-fi audience with its uh, sci-fi noir look and feel and themes and like conversations about bigotry and war and espionage and politics. While this, it's just like, it's so safe on any of the dark subject matters. Like the villains are supposed to be these evil alien forces that will destroy everything, but they're talked about in a way that you would hear in a cartoon show. And uh, Rachel, for you, tell us a bit more about your experiences with this. This is your first time. Clearly, you're not a fan, but tell us a bit more about your your journey with it. This was a piece of media where I got so bored I couldn't sit down and watch it. I had to get up and do something else. I just, like... I just got so tired of it before it was even, like, halfway through. I, like, 
gave myself a break and came back and tried again. I realized it wasn't going to get any better and it wasn't going to get any more interesting. And the, the thing that made me the most annoyed was how boring it was. Even being tossed out would be better than this. I should be commanding a ship right now, not, not this. The ways of the council are wise. They felt that a menial task such as this would calm your mind, clear your thoughts of distractions. I, I have a hard time giving those negative criticisms easily because I find that the ones I will say are blanket statements for pilots that you will often get. And as as already mentioned, this just keeps falling into the, 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 into the traps that you will often see. The first major note I have here is repetition. This falls into that mistake that you see with early episodes of shows where they feel the need to repeat information, repeat certain things. We've been making jokes about the the Rangers' motto and how they have to keep repeating that. They just keep they, overemphasizing they, these they, things again and again and again I and re- again. I'm going to pick on your statement. They don't have to. No, they don't have to. They just they do that. They don't have to. But I think a big part of that is because, like, you know, it's important to the characters, it's important to the organisation, it's important to the themes. But it's also so if somebody comes in halfway through, they're going to get the They're going to understand where they're up to. But, again, you don't have to do these things, but you see these all the time. Just this, this, I guess, this desire for the audience to buy the show as well as the network to buy the show so you have to keep claiming what it's about and hey here's our catchphrase and here's what this character's motivations are we'll tell you it again and again and again and again and again uh luke is that something that you often see within the the tv movie pilots this this problem of uh the writing or or the characters or any of this stuff having to just keep conveying the same things again and again yeah pilots are always going to be a little clunky i mean ideally they won't be but i think you'll frequently see and you've said like even shows that go to air uh, and they get better as they go you'll often find the pilots be clunky a little bit too much information and you're right you're, you're saying they keep repeating their slogan and some of that stuff i will say the problem with this one is they i did not know they were warrior priests until i read the summary you sent me nobody says that once in there i don't know what the rangers do really i don't know who the one is they say they keep saying it but I, like it doesn't actually explain anything. They just like keep they like we introduce the characters. They're like we're gonna give you a new ship. You're some sort of like leading force, keeping the alliance safe. But like I'm just like they're an order of warrior priest is news to me. Like they just did a bad job of like providing context for these characters. And I I mean it's part of the problem is it's part of a larger series. So maybe they thought they didn't have to. But you're right. They like they keep hammering a few things but then they forget to tell you about the things that would like provide context yeah i think they sidestepped that because who the one is is a spoiler for the show it's not it's not relevant to this but it is the ranger slogan because it's a religious organization as stated and their one is their jesus equivalent valen who is who's talked about in this uh movie by the ship name but it does not even matter because what Luke says is like complaints you may think are associated to someone who hasn't seen the show, but as someone who has seen the show, I completely agree with him as well. If if oh, you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, no, 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 about like I know that they're religious warrior monk guys, but they don't utilize that no. in any way, shape, or form in this movie. Like, there's no conversations about spirituality or religion or any of that. Truly, there is no the conflict conversations about in the dojo. Kind of skirt around those ideas, but. It's not about that. But you could easily play that off, Rachel, as those heady conversations about what it is to be a leader, to be a soldier, to be so on and so on. Like, for instance, Space Above and Beyond would have conversations like in that dojo a million times over, and that was about being a soldier, being a warrior. You could easily apply that, but I, I'm uh, I'm shocked too that they are warrior monks, but you really don't get any of the the monk aspect to it. And even to make it crazier for you, Luke, here's a bombshell for you. So the Minbari, the guys with bones on their heads, they have a three-caste system. They have religious caste, warrior caste, 
and workers. Now, out of the two main Minbaris we see, like the guy who's our main character's best friend and the one that he was a rival against that sacrificed a ship, guess what? Both of those guys are religious. Both of them were religious cast guys. Yeah, yeah they, they hint at some of these little pieces, but because they're sort of saying, like, I understood that the Minbari were the rangers for centuries. Like, they've been around for a long time, which is an interesting idea. Like, this is an organization that's been around for thousands of years. And, but then they're like, the humans are kind of new, though weirdly the crew, like when we first see them, the crew is like half and half. So it seems like, well, an awful lot of humans for a place. And then they're like, oh, and we're bringing two new recruits on from other races. But they never, like, there's no, I, like, I, another show would spend some time giving you the context of like, this is why there aren't other people. And this is why this show is happening now, because there's a pivot happening in the organization. New races are entering. This is how it's changing the dynamics. Like that that's, that's a hook to bring you into the show. And they, they, they definitely hint at it. There's the idea that there, there's some new people joining, but they don't provide the context of what that means for the world they live in, for like the adventures they're going to go on, why this is new, why this is different. So it, as a result, like, they they say the words, but they don't give you the the little tease you need to like really hook you and be like, oh, so if this uh, this Narn joins, that's right, right? The 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 Narn. If this Narn's joining, uh, that's going to be different because typically Narns are their sworn enemies. It's like kind of like when Worf is on TNG, it's a surprise. And why is it a surprise? Because he used to be the their his race used to be the enemies, but he was raised on Earth. And you know, that gives you a hook. That character now has like some meat to the bones that you're like, oh, how's this gonna play out? Whereas in this is just like the the Narn's joining. I'm like, okay, and they're like, he just wasn't here before. I'm like, yeah. why? Yeah. Like, give me some information. You have the Narn and the Drazi, but guess what? What you said is done in the movie but it's via our main character he's he says here's the reason why i signed these people up because they like me because i'm a human and although i've been here for three to four years in strict ranger camp training and doing all the missions i'm still an outsider because i'm a rough and tumble guy who doesn't like doing it the minbari way and you even get it at the beginning with jakar and the minbari guy that minbar and earth were at a war at one point so it's like you, you have meat there, but the problem is the main character is just so uh, rugged, handsome, boring protagonist man that you're yearning for his statement that he says about these other characters to come to fruition about those other characters because there's potential there. While with our guy, you said it, Rachel, you accept that there's not going to be much potential after a certain point, and I think that about the main guy as soon as you meet him. You know exactly what he is. You've seen it before. I kept saying in my notes, this guy is Captain Kirk type. He's a Captain Kirk type character. But when I say it, I mean the J.J. Abrams Captain Kirk. I don't mean Shatner Kirk. Because at least Shatner Kirk is a little bit more thoughtful in his approach to life. While this guy, it's like, give me some introspection. Give me some He's more the layers. the misconception of what original Kirk is. It's doing a poor job at... Selling a show about a ragtag misfit crew that is part of this bigger system. They're uh, a branch of the Alliance. They have a long history, but it's a new and complicated time. And we have these big villains that they're going to be facing off against. Now... Here's something that just came to me when you said that, and this works for Babylon 5, definitely this would work, and it probably should be here, but I want to get both of your opinions on this. There's no conflict within the ragtag crew. When you say there's a ragtag crew, there's a, a bunch of different people of different lifestyles, there's no there's no friction between any of them. It, it's like what you're saying, Luke, about they say, oh, he's a Narn and he's a Drazi. That's going to be an issue. And then it never is. It's like, what do they replace it with instead? It's just everyone kind of gets along really well. <laughs> yeah, there's no time for interpersonal conflict because they're setting up the conflict on the galaxy scale. Hmm. And 
Luke, what do you think about that? When you're starting a show, what are you drawn to? Are you drawn to when they're selling you on the universe of it, the premise of it, the characters, or the themes? What draws you in with that stuff early on? I mean, it'll vary. And I mean, I think you'll see that in this pilot is kind of trying to figure out what it is. And I think what has happened in the pilot is they've decided to focus on the lead character, which is understandable. He's going to lead the show. But they have, as we've already mentioned, they haven't given him enough of a turn. He's kind of one note throughout the show. There's not enough of a turn to give him a hook. And then other than that, they've focused on the plot. And what, what that is, is introducing a new villain who's going to come in, a new big bad, your new Borg or whatever. Ultimately, it's just um, it's the Borg element or the uh, the hand I believe they're called in this is is not till the very end do they even explain like what's ha- they're a, they're another for they're living in another dimension they've now made like sleeper cells amongst other races that are around here so they've got like vassal states in the regular universe they're going to have to be battling and that comes in very late in the pilot too. It isn't particularly exciting and it doesn't because we don't know the context of the the world. Like, yes, we know they're bad and it's going to be bad for the Alliance. But, you know, we don't really get a sense of why or how other than it's like they're very evil. So that doesn't really work. But since those are in the forefront of the show, as, as you guys were mentioning, like the other characters, they get they pop up for a scene like we learn. The new engineer, who is it's she's the first one of her race in the in the in the Rangers, and her character is she's like good at her job, but she's a bit grouchy. No, not much there. There's the uh, covert operations officer who is the worst covert operations officer. He's clumsy and kind of like like very like he has no he's not smooth. He's clumsy. He's a bit of a goof. I, like I'm just like I, I maybe maybe that's an interesting character but we don't see it like we just get a quick glimpse of him and what we know is he's gonna be comic relief and the narn also a uh, comic relief because he's got a funny name and that's a drowsy like, actually the non is the drowsy, sorry, lady drowsy. the non is what jakar is i flopped it around the um but uh, he is the the he like I, you could have put a little effort into his character. I mean, he's just literally, he literally is there to lift things. I'm like, you wouldn't hire that guy. You don't need a guy to lift things. Like, that's not a, that's not a role on a ship. Like, what's his role? You're expecting like, there's, a there's turn, just, like, like you said, like, oh, they, tra- they treat him as the big dumb guy that is useless. His job is I lift things. We don't need a person that lifts things. Oh, he's here anyway. He's a drowsy. Oh, and then... At the end, he's going to show some act of courage or insight or wisdom or something that you wouldn't have thought of because you judge a book by its cover. Simple. But no, Sim- but no, they don't even do that. He just gets shot. That's it. <laughs> he just gets shot and falls down. And then he gets up again. Yeah, it's so. The, so, and I get it. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes your side characters get a side role in the pilot and you have to come back and do a little more work on them. But it just, you know, I think on this particular pilot, it would have made more sense to, you know, it's a workplace drama, really. Like these shows are workplace dramas. Like how are these people going to work together? And like that probably would have been the hook, but there's just, but yeah, I, I have a feeling it's just, this pilot needed to come out. It doesn't feel like it had a lot of rewrites or time to gestate. So they don't really know who these characters are. Like the woman who runs the, um, defense system, like she's kind of snarky, but that's about it. The, I, the poor navigator, he doesn't even have a character. I don't know who that guy is at what all. What about the healer? Um, who and, says, I'm here to heal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's literally it. Which is, it happens. Like, I'll say that there, there's the one good idea I think that is in here that is barely in here, but it, it's, it's the one part that was interesting. The rest of it's pretty paint by numbers. Ragtag crew gonna go meet the new big bad in space and like you're gonna tune in to watch like how are they gonna deal with this thing that's too powerful you know all oh, that's paint by numbers none of it's very original and I'm not saying this is like 100 percent original but the fact that the ship is haunted by ghosts of past crews is really interesting but barely utilized and when it is utilized like there's once I love the bit where the ghost shows up and his mouth opens wide. It's cool. It looks it's a little freaky. I like for for the time slot. It's not like scary, but that's cool. And there's this idea that just like there's a traitor in our midst because there was a traitor in the midst of the other crews. And I was like, oh, so we're going to solve the ghost problem. But then at the end of it, what you come to find is just like the traitor that killed the last crew was 
unrelated to the traitor that killed the current crew, but why are the ghosts like it? Like they set up this idea that, that doesn't ever pay off. It doesn't really make any sense. So it's very odd. There's like a whole bunch of threads that don't really connect to anything. Did he say anything before that? Anything at all? Nothing more than what he said to you that something is wrong and that the spirits of this ship do not rest easy. What happened to kill the last crew of this ship is less of an issue than keeping this one alive, and I simply don't buy... <sighs> Look, I've known Dulan for over three years. I know he's slightly telepathic, but I just don't buy this whole bit about sensing the dead. Rachel, what do you think about the novel concept, and I love how, how Luke illustrated it, of the ship is haunted by the ghosts of the previous crew I wanted stuff. that to be more! I wanted that to be more. I 100%. want them... I want them to, like, become part of the crew. <laughs> well, only one of the people can see them because he's slightly telepathic, which, just say he's a telepath, why not? You can do that. You can just have a Minbari telepath. There's no rules against it. I don't know why they had to clarify that. Like, oh, he's only slightly telepathic. Why? <laughs> why Why do you say it like that? I think it's because they thought if they have a telepath just always there, it's too... It's too powerful. It's like we can't have a full beta zoid. Yes, you so, have the Deanna Troy problem where you have to write ways to not have them in the plot. Oh, Deanna Troy's just not in this episode. Or, oh no, I can't get a read on him. Like you'd have that. But here's the saddest thing. He was my favorite character in the in the whole thing. I loved that guy. I thought he was a great character. The the so Minbari I. who was best friends with our human friend, and he was unlike all of the other Minbari we saw in the movie because he was less cold and emotionless, less snooty, it's less nice. It's like bound by rules. Yeah, he's clearly had more growth and is more accepting than others. Because he has spent three years with the lead character. And I love those type of relationships, the lived-in relationship that we don't have to see the blossomings of. We just come in bit way through. They've been friends for years. And I thought that those two actors really worked well together. And I and I actually thought that the performance from our lead was heightened in those scenes because he had a character saying funny things and poking fun at the lead. And it gained some level of grit or some level of nuance to our main man. But then, inexplicably, they just take out this fun Minbari character. And I've seen this. I've seen this, I don't know how many times. I always think of there's this uh, Matt Damon movie. Does anyone rem remember this movie called, what was it, The Great Wall? With, or The Wall, where the premise is, oh no, it's a Great Wall of China, and there's a wall, uh, uh, the wall we, is there because yeah, lizards. Yeah, I watched that with you. And that movie had Matt Damon and Pedro Pascal as like, you know, rough and tumble bandits uh, coming in to pillage stuff, and they just have this lived-in buddy relationship. And then a bit way through, they remove... Pedro Pascal, because we need to focus on Matt Damon having a brooding character arc. That's how I feel about this. It's like, why are you removing the thing that makes the lead character more interesting? I thought their bond, their relationship was genuinely compelling. I don't know if you felt the same in any way, Luke. Did you like this character? Or were there any characters in this that uh, did succeed for you or did pique that interest of if this did go on further, you might have liked to see them more? I don't know. It's hard to tell. They were all pretty flimsy characters. I, I mean, you're not wrong. The uh, psychic Minbari. At first, I was a little... Has, I, often, there's just like... Psychic is just like a character type you put in. You're like, we'll figure out what to do with that later. At least he had something to do in this. Like, I it was nice to have someone have a connection to the ghosts. Uh, I would have preferred to see him being more haunted, but it, we, he has so little time. I, I think, like, I mean, you can tell... Uh, Jakar is the only one who like knows his character and like has a has an idea of what to do with it. So becomes a standard very quickly, but also is clearly not meant to be on the crew. I mean, maybe this is where they could have benefited from like having one of the regulars from the original series move over to this one. So at least you have like some sort of touchstone. But I did I didn't find anyone there was nobody on this crew that I was like, can't wait to find out what they do next week. <laughs> Rachel, a new cast of characters. 
Are they too familiar to what we've seen before? Are they too different? Would you have liked to have seen any of them uh, in future adventures? Or were there ones that you favoured over others or ones that yeah. you really hated? I I also enjoyed Telepath Minbari. I didn't mind the member of the Grey Council that we got to know, I think. Mm. He could have been an interesting boss figure. The guy assigning them their mission. Mm-hmm. 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 Um, yeah, like there's nobody from the original show that they could just move over. No, because everyone gets so wrapped up yeah. by the end that it could only really be Jakar here because his whole entire thing was he was wandering the universe. That's where we left him. Yeah. And Lita could have been here. Lita could have been here. Linear. No. <laughs> no, thank you. If they hadn't done certain things, would have been the connection, I think. Because in season five, he's becoming a ranger. Yeah. And did you have any other things to say about these characters, their their types, their molds, what they could have blossomed into from what you saw here? Um most of them seem like be like I think it's like 50/50 with the crew that we get to know. Oh no. It's, most of them are just good at their jobs. They're all just too competent. Like the Nana engineer gets things working, is, like, effective at giving information. The pilot seems to do a great job. The weapons chick also seems very successful. Uh, the captain's, like, he figures it out in the end. And there's not much to him. Uh He's like, yeah, I'm in command. I'll do it. Um, the secret ops guy mm-hmm. is a fool, but also just does the thing and does it well straight up. Like, none of the characters do a bad job at their job. They're under very extreme circumstances, but it it's just like they're all competent. And then we have a, a lead man, a lead guy whose name is John, isn't it? What is it? No, David, sorry. John yeah. Sheridan. David is Sheridan's son's name, but this is also this guy's name. And you were like, oh, is this guy David Sheridan? And I'm like, no, he's another guy called David. Don't get it confused. Don't get it twisted, Rachel. But David Martel, he's here. I don't even know what to say about him. Like, he's a guy. They often do this, don't they? Where, still to this day, they do this where it's like the lead character has to be... A Bland. Sm- not just that, but they have to be cocky to be interesting is the thought process. Like, this guy, not only in his performance, but in the writing, has a constant smug grin throughout all of it. Such as, he does do horrible things in this movie. Like, his character tortures a prisoner and is willing to kill them like, and literally does kill them, and yet I don't feel like there's any darkness to that at all. What do you think about that, Luke? That we've talked about this character in part, that he's this goody two-shoes, he's this rugged, handsome guy, he's never wrong, but he does do things in this movie that you would assume are morally questionable and or wrong, but at least in my eyes, I never really felt any of that. Did you? Yeah, I mean, right at the end, uh, not to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, he sends a man to his death, and I was just like, oh, well, this is pretty bad. This is a pretty bad thing to do. I know the guy was, like, a bad guy, but, like, I don't know. It doesn't set your character up as being good when you do that. And But they they really wave it away. Like, I believe some other character comes on and just, like, it's all right, though. He deserved it. Like, they really... He killed a thousand people. They, all, Who cares? Yeah, at all costs, they... At all costs, they don't want the lead character to be bad or morally gray. And you're right, because that's the thing. He's he is just by nature of I think the character, just generic, 
handsome, Han Solo-y kind of white guy. They're giving him all those kind of like, he's a bit smug and he's a bit, he's a, he doesn't play by the rules, but he's always right. But that's not interesting unless he's that character and he's wrong. They gave him a kind of one note. And, you know, I think the result of the plot is he seemed to do some bad things, but that wasn't the intention of the writing was to make him a bad guy. They And you can see it in, in the writing in that right at the end, right before he kills the man, <laughs> uses him as like a human bomb or an alien bomb, I guess is not human. But the crew on the ship is all mad at the captain because they, they think the captain has let the bad guy go. And so there's this moment where they're like, oh, you you failed us, Captain. You let the bad guy go. That's not what the Rangers are about. The Rangers are about dying or something. They The Rangers seem to be about dying a lot. His uh, crime he's like, That's not what they're like. That, you, you failed us. Staying alive. <laughs> Jakar argues that yeah. there is also to live, but sure. It's warrior honor. That, that is a good line. That is a good line. Oh, yeah. Jakar gets all the best lines. Um, but because they're mad at him. He's the best thing about this. Because the crew is mad. Far. Absolutely. Absolutely. But because the crew's mad at him for letting the bad guy get away, that when they do the big reveal, he's like, just kidding, I didn't. I turned him into a human bomb. Then all the crew's just happy. And excited. Now, if you reverse that and like, they let him go away, the crew's not exactly happy. But when they find out what the captain did, if there's at least one or two people in the crew who are like, whoa, that's too extreme. Like, then you have, you know, then there seems to be push and pull in the show. You feel like the, the writers intend there to be a moral uh, problem. But what they do is they like, they're mad and then the guy explodes and everyone's happy. They're just telegraphing you. It's like, see, he's good. We've, we've let you know that everyone in the show thinks he's good and hence you should also think he's good. So there was never any intention of making him morally gray, which I think is a little bit of the issue uh, for sure around that. But yeah, I think we've covered it. Like, I think the, his big issue is he's just mostly one note. What do you want out of uh, your sci-fi captain? Because he is the sci-fi captain. He sits in the chair and leans on one arm and says, hit it. It feels like he is almost like a perfect mold of what Captain Pike is in Strange New Worlds or, or like I said, Chris Pine in, in, in the Star Trek movies. Like, what what do you want out of, like, your, your sci-fi captain? Because there's such an archetypical role. Like, when you start a science fiction series, you're, you're expecting this type. Rachel, what do you want out of this type? Especially as someone who's watched a lot of sci-fi now. Like, what is it about this type you're looking for? Or what is it about this type that does succeed for you? I want some level of struggle. I don't necessarily mean I want them to be bad at their job, but I want them to feel the weight of their decisions. And as you unpacked with the torture scene, is an excellent example of their failure to do that. What I think I've really come to grow accustomed to or, or appreciative of uh, with this type of uh, ca- a character or, or the position of them is I really am craving ones with the ability of introspection and contemplation. Yeah. Maybe that's me having grown up with Captain Picard and Sinclair from Babylon 5, where they were very much people who would take a moment to smell the roses and really examine the situation on on a philosophical level. You know, that's not dissimilar to what I'm asking for. Because like, when I'm saying I want them to struggle, I need them to reflect on their choices and their options and it not just to be, uh, what, what did he say? It's like, we're faced with the same options, fight, flee, or, or hide. hide. So we're going with hide and I know how to do that. <laughs> Everyone, let's go. Uh, Luke, what about you? When you have your, your sci-fi lead, your, your, your captain figure, what is it that makes you drawn to them and or what are the things about them that are successful? I mean, it's it's hard to put a finger on, but I think the big issue is there's too many tropes around it. And so as soon as you hit those tropes, you're just doing something I've seen before. Like, I, I just want to see something new, right? Like, just I mean, you mentioned Captain McCard and like, 
he was sort of new. Like he wasn't like people complained. He wasn't at all like Kirk. He was that contemplative, like kind of captain. He stayed on the ship. He didn't go on. So that was at least new and made it a little fresh when you, uh, when you bring Deep Space Nine, or I know he's not the captain at the start, but uh, you bring in a captain. Now he, he's kind of disillusioned with Starfleet and uh, Cisco doesn't like Picard. They're, they're, they're quite opposite. So that's a little bit fresh and new. And I think, Really, what it is is just like a lot of the time these things fail in these pilots. It's because we're getting that Captain Kirk knockoff. And you can do it a few times. You can find some new range in that character like two or three times. You know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. But at this point in sort of science fiction TV, we've now seen that character reiterated so many times. There's just no, it's too hard to come up with a fresh angle. You You really have to find something brand new find find a completely different character type and drop them in there someone who you who's the opposite of that it really it is just like i i just tired of seeing the same tropes over and over again i i'd rather i'd rather watch i mean in some ways like maybe just stop making sci-fi shows about captains make a make a show about like the engineer and then he's there's a captain but he's like as opposed to like the admiral who sends you on missions, who's a hard ass. Maybe maybe he just has to talk to the captain every ten. You would have you would I love just, Star you would love Star Trek entry. Discovery because that's what the idea is supposed to be. You're following all of these other ones. Well, and I think I think that was a good idea. I mean, that show went through a ton of turmoil and its pre production changed so much. Like I think the original idea was it was going to be a standalone series where we look at someone on a crew and it's not about like a captain, but. They changed showrunners. It got swapped around a bunch. Then the network's like, this needs to be a typical Star Trek show. So can we find a way of just like having a crew? And, you know, it, it, it has its flaws and it has suffered as a result of that, like because it was serving too many masters and was restructured too much. But it's not a bad idea. It's just, you know, it, it's tough to do strong leading male captain anymore, like who just like all he is is snarky, Han Solo, ragtag. It like, you feels know, default. We can, we can only see it as an audience so much time. Yeah, default, exactly. So that's why you wanted me to keep the ship on a straight line with the pod. So they think the transmission was coming from inside the pod. They know what we did last time. And they knew that we knew that they knew. So they made the perfectly logical assumption that we wouldn't dare try it again. And you didn't tell us this because... because I wanted your reactions to be sincere. They were. This is something that's interesting. Now... Luke, you've only seen the one episode of Babylon 5, which was Mind War. It was all of that time ago, and Jakar was in it. Jakar was one of the lead characters of that episode. He was the lead of the B-plot, at least, but he was involved. And I'm just wanting to know your thoughts as someone who's now come back a couple of years later and you see his character here. What do you think about uh, Jakar in general? I mean, you could really see an actor who's comfortable in a role and a role that's been like well worn because he stands out so much in the episode. Like you can't take your eyes off him. He's he's handling every scene, even when he's like fed some pretty cheesy lines occasionally uh, where he has to like reference Earth stuff, which I always I always find it annoying. When it's like, remember that 20th century Earth thing? I'm like, all right, great. Uh huh. I know who this is for. But he he delivers everything with a plum. He's so watchable. Like it it. It just it doesn't do the series any favors in some ways because you're just like, look at this guy. Let's hang out with him as much as we can. But you know he's leaving at the end of the episode. So you're like, I got to hang out with the rest of these people. And he's very different to when seen last. He, in fact, references a line that he said in Mind War, which is not everyone hears what they appear to be which is a very famous line from, from Babylon 5. And they reused it here to add wait and it's sad when that happens when you see a a show or a movie make a callback to a very profound moment to try and say what you're in now is profound and it is not like when Jakar says that at the end of this movie I'm like oh, no it doesn't really work here Jakar I love you he has so many other great moments but he does stand out like a sore thumb and and Rachel this is the last time we we'll, we will see Jakar, played by Andreas Katsoulis. This is the last time. So do you have any feelings about that? Any moments that you want to uh, highlight at least? I'm glad he got to have fun doing it one more time. And it, it is the best part of this television film. Like, it's just irrefutable in my eyes. And he's... It's really nice to see 
where he's at after the experiences during the show and after his, you know, great tour with Lita and what is and isn't the same. I... I'm going to say something that may get some arms up in the air. I really don't like Jakar in this. Now, Andreas is great, and he has some great lines, but I just don't really like him in this. I I kept looking at him and being like, you tonally don't match anything else in this. And Oh, he doesn't belong here. He doesn't belong in this. He doesn't this, belong here. And he's only there Agreed. as fan service. Like, hey, it's a legacy character. You know this. No one belongs here. But, yes, no one belongs here. But at the same time, like, the crew itself, for all of its faults, they fit a certain tonal mold, at least. There's some uh, coherence with that. But Jakar, he, he, he's so well well realized too. How would but- you describe the tone of the the what's the name of the fucking ship? The the yeah, that's a that, great great question. The- what's the name of the ship? I can't tell you. The- I could tell you what the- Babylon Five the- is Baratha? called. Sure, no, I the I think Agatha? I think their tone is they're 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 wet behind the ears a little. You know, like they've got some stuff going on where some of them experience, some of them are not. They're still figuring it out, but like they've got the, like that innocence to them is what I would say. Jakar, he's just such a kooky character. Like, he's such a kook. He's been around the block. And, okay, so, yeah, And maybe I get that. he should be there because we need a kooky character because none of them are kooky. They're all just so safe. But oh, what I also I know don't... some of those attempts at humor oh man i laughed when the drowsy guy said his name and that was it and he's fat did you get that oh the explanation of his name was hilarious tears rolling down my face oh my god that was so no no luke it was great you loved it right that was your uh to live for the one to die for the one but i what i hate about jakar too is this is it this is the final time right this is the final time and if you look at it from that angle, what a waste. What a oh, fucking yeah. waste. And not even just, they didn't know that the act would pass away, but even so, like, there was a period of time where they thought that this was the final Babylon 5 thing, and it's like, yeah, they didn't know that they weren't going to get picked up, but still, like, what a fucking waste, because the ending of his story in the show is so good, why touch it? And it's like, well, because he's the best character in the show, so you've got to touch and it. And they need somebody here. And I and I I get so frustrated with these with these big sci-fi properties like ongoing ones like your 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 Battlestar Galactica, your Babylon Five, Star Trek, Star Wars, where you told the story, you told it, those characters, you put them to bed, you put them to rest, like we're all satisfied, and then it's like, oh, we've got the opportunity to tell more stories in that universe. Let's just drag them up again and kind of give them this weird nebulous endpoint. I hate that. I fucking hate that. Like now we just have this weird little oh, by the way, Jakar had another adventure, but it not really. So like he had a life in between leaving with Lisa and meeting up with Londo again. We had that told to us in the show we didn't need to see it and now we're seeing it it's like oh okay i get annoyed with that but there's one thing that this is remembered for and we've said it but i think we really need to talk fucking what the fuck why the fuck like i know who the fuck what rachel what you're just (sighs) screaming now what are you talking about who where what when why how what do you yes come on the guns and the ship, and Sarah shoots them yeah. by punching and kicking. And she screams. And she has to jump through a hole to get to a secret room. And there's this thing that happens with her eye. What? Yeah, it's remembered for the bad <laughs> shooting scene. It's remembered for the somersaults, kicking, punching, gunning thing, and it's it it makes no sense. Like logistically, yeah, just get a machine to do it. Uh, but it is memorable. You press a button. Say what you will you about this. You will remember the way that this show used the ship to fire guns because it's so bad. This is one of those where it is a simple statement of. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Like, what was the thought? Like, they were thinking it looks cool. But even then, why, why, why change this? This is one of those things you don't need to change. Like, yeah, the ship fires stuff. You don't, you know what's not interesting 
about spaceship battles. It's the parts where you see the characters pushing the buttons and whatnot. So this is the show saying, well, well, we're going to spice that up. She's punching and kicking, and then we cut to the exterior of the ships blowing up. No, just focus on the ship battles. That's all we want. And it's not like this movie's lacking the ability to have a bunch of CG everywhere. They have CG with her, so... Fuck it, just do the thing, just do the thing. But yes, everyone mocks this, everyone fucking ridicules this, everyone slams us into the dirt, because it's one of those things where you see it happen on the screen and you react like you do, Rachel. What the fuck? What is this? Because even up until that point, as silly as the tone is, as silly as like what what we've been saying, nothing could prepare you for the guns <laughs> of the ship firing by a lady squealing and kicking and jumping and spinning around and uh, Luke you've had to go through a myriad of sci-fi shows that have maybe ludicrous uh, sci-fi concepts thrown in there Uh, how does this one fare for you is this one of those ones where it's like it's okay it's medium or is this kind of not memorable like what do you feel about this because as stated this is a thing that the fan base all like point to as that's what Legend of the Rangers is. It's that scene of her screaming and grunting as she punches lasers. I mean, that poor actress, there's just no way to sell that. There's just no way on earth to sell that. It's really funny. It's really, really funny because it's bad. It's really like a silly idea executed in an even sillier way. I I mean, I I guess you have to give it that. It stands out in a pretty dull episode of just like the sudden first the first time it happens, you're obviously shocked, but they give her she doesn't get any character development, but they give her such a long sequence where she fights like 3000 minds at one time. And she's really given her all. She's like double punch, double fist punches, triple kicks. I'm just like, oh, my God, it keeps going and going. And you're just like, oh. What are you doing? I mean, I've, I've seen versions of this kind of thing. Like, I, honestly, as I said before, tech war. This feels so tech war to me. Um, but it is, you know, if you like something that's silly and bad in sci-fi TV, at least you got that out of this pilot. Like, you got you got something truly unique in that. <laughs> As we get to the final moments here, the hand, the new big bad. This is all fucking stupid. Wow, Rachel. What? What? I'm shocked. I haven't heard you say that at all during this discussion. So you better clarify this really (sighs) out of left field statement that it's uh, stupid. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Face of it. I really dislike it. When they're like, this bat will make your other big bad look like child's play. And that's how you know this is serious, motherfuckers. The, the big bad you, you dealt with for four seasons of television was actually very insignificant in comparison to this one. Yeah, it's just like, no, you just needed to up the stakes and you didn't have anywhere to go. So you just... You... It's very frustrating that they try and deflate the shadows so that they inflate the hand. But but they don't do anything for the hand that's scary or menacing or show of force. There's just a... The quiet build-up, which I find to be perfectly acceptable. It has worked many times over. It worked in Babylon 5 where the shadows were slowly, slowly built up and there was this cosmic horror slowly approaching our characters and it worked there but in this that they, they need to have something more they they the, there's i like the concept that they have intimidated smaller societies to fall into line but that's not novel either that's not even unique to this series uh it's just such we that was literally londo's entire story was he sought power and he teamed up with a powerful race who he didn't understand. And by the time he understood what they were and the consequences of his actions, it was too late. And it was a great story. Here, it's just like Saturday morning cartoon villains like, you will fall into line with the hand. Isn't the hand the villains in Daredevil? Yep. That really, that really threw me off. 
Yeah, I couldn't stop thinking about Daredevil, and then I was like, oh, I remember the Ninja Turtles and how they're villains with a foot. And I was just thinking about Ninja Turtles, and again, I kept thinking that this would be a great car- like cartoon show or Saturday morning kids series, which Babylon 5 had, by the way. People forget it, but there was a series called Hypernauts that exists, by the way, which serves this exact function, but yeah, the hand is the the big bad. I found it very funny that their spokesperson, who is not a member of the hand, but just some other race, was a guy in a big hood with pointy shoulders. I love that. I thought, oh, this has a Lord of the Rings feel because this movie has Lord of the Rings, Merle, you know, Lord of the Rings, King Arthur, fantastical feel to it. I mean, Legend of the Rangers, its initials are the same as Lord of the Rings, for Christ's sake. So it very much is is going there. But uh, Luke, this was a movie that is all setting up the the big bad. Would you be interested in the big bad? Did you find anything about the hand uh, fascinating at all? It's a real first draft bad guy you're bringing in here. It's too big, too powerful, to to the point that they even know they're not quite sure what it is yet, that they're like, oh, we live in another dimension, so we're not going to show you them yet. Well, we're working on it, though. We're going to figure out what's exciting about this sometime in the future. (laughs) And would you have stuck around, Rachel? No. Luke? No, no, definitely not. It's a... Real swing and a miss. God, no. This, I don't know, though, because, like, how many of these shows that do make it would you have actually stuck around for if you saw the pilot alone? Like, would you have stuck around for TNG if it wasn't a follow-up to Star Trek? Like, if you just saw Encounter at Farpoint, would you have stuck around? Would you have stuck around for Babylon 5 if you saw The Gathering, Rachel? Like, would you, how many of these would you actually stick around for? Yeah, like, that. That that's fair. Um, I, I personally don't hate Encounter at Farpoint, so yeah, I, I would have. I definitely would have dropped off somewhere during season one for at least a little bit. I don't have that much faith in myself. <sighs> now, let's get into the spotlight section, the part of the show where we talk about an actor or actress that appeared in the given episode, and which one are we going through, Rachel? This is your favourite section of the show because you love the film Spotlight, so you wanted to have a moment where we always reference Spotlight in some way, so let's call the bit where we talk about an actor's performance or their career Spotlight. So who are we talking about? Are we talking about the big fat Drazi guy? He was pretty funny. No, uh... We're going with the obvious choice, our leading man. Dylan Neal? Yes. I want to keep saying O'Neal, but it's Neal. Um, do you have any further things to say about what he did offer up to this? He did reasonably well with what he was given. That's it. I don't know, and I feel like this is such a awful thing to say, but... I don't know if he's genuinely charming because of his performance abilities or if he's just handsome. I can't differentiate it's a it. Cut, isn't it? Yeah. When we started Farscape, when we watched Farscape, <laughs> I you was saw, wondering you how saw, long it was going to take you to bring this mm-hmm. up. You saw Ben Browder and you went, oh, another boring, handsome guy. Generic, handsome man. And yeah, I had that same thought. But then but yeah, it was quickly it evident that it wasn't. The charisma wasn't from just his looks. It was because he had a certain acting style that was kooky and strange. But this guy, I can't tell if if it's that. Like, when I see William Shatner as Kirk, mm. when you actually sit down and watch Kirk or Shatner in general, there's a twinkle in those eyes mm. that gets turned on from his acting abilities that make me swoon. But this guy, I, I'm wrestling if it's one or the other like i can't tell if it's just oh he's got the hair he's got the jaw he's got the muscles he's got that cocky grin or if if it's more about the acting because i've not seen this actor in anything else so i have nothing to compare uh, against but it's mostly his face luke what do you think about uh the actual performance here we've talked about the faults and issues of of the character but this is the man that they cast to hopefully uh, be the person who helmed the series if it went forward. What do you think of uh, Dylan Neal? I think he's not doing a terrible job. I mean, I've seen a lot of this type of character, generic, handsome male lead, and 
it, it can get a lot worse than this. I think he he's bringing a little something to the character. There's not much for him to work with, obviously, but I, I, I by the end of it, I was like, I was like, he's charming. There's a bit of charmingness to him. This, you know, you can do this completely wooden. It's completely different. I, I've seen it done uh, like with a wooden guy with no emotions at all. So I, I think he's not doing a terrible job. I mean. It's a it's a thankless role, and he's doing his best with it. I you know no one's gonna probably nail it too far out of the park, but I didn't think he did a bad job. I was surprised that I I was as charmed by him as I was. Was there a specific moment for you that uh, leaps out as an example of the work he was doing here that did uh, hook you in a bit? I think after the dojo, I I, I knew the character was going to be awful after we got to the dojo scene where he's been like demoted to water boy, and they're like. Oh, well, if you just died instead of not dying, you would have been good. And then he's like, you want to see me fight? And he fights and he wins because he's like, cannot be wrong about anything. I sort of written off the character. Uh, But when they sort of took him outside and he was looking at the ship, talking about his stuff. And like, it's all very generic. Like, I was going to work on that ship, but now my career is, you know, kind of uh, lamenting things and talking about his career. The character, I was just like, oh, this actor's bringing a little more pathos to it than he need do. I mean, you know, he's, he read the script. He knows he's not working with Shakespeare here or anything. But he's, he's, I think he was doing more than I think a lot of actors might have in the same position. It's an opportunity for him. Up until this point in his career, he did mainly one-and-done roles, lots of small bits, maybe in movies, so on, and and guest roles, not leading roles, Rachel. Mm. You give me a look like, yeah, he was in Sabrina as like a love interest, but like for the most part, he was another person in a show. Like, rarely was he, you're in charge now. You are the face of this show. He's not the guy that's on the IMDb thumbnail picture. No. That's True. what I mean by by that. Okay. But tell us a bit, Rachel, from what you've been able to gather about this actor, what his uh, career has been like. Uh, his uh, best known roles on IMDb, uh, two of them are the f- from the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise. I was shocked to see that. Where he plays Bob. Who's Bob, though? Do you know? Does anyone know the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise? Luke, I know you're a bit of a I bit of a man of culture. I assumed it was like what the secure like Christian's head of security? Nope. Uh Luke, are you a Fifty Shades of Grey man? I prefer the novels to the movie, so I'm not sure who he played in the movie. Well, Bob is her stepfather. Oh. There you go. I looked excited to look it up. I'm like, I have to know if he was in any sexy scenes or he was a boss or something. Oh, yeah. I nah, he's, her, he's her stepdad who's kind of nice, kind of not. That's it. But uh, do you know the, the B5 connection? Do you know the Babylon 5 connection here? So he was in a, a, a project that JMS helmed before Babylon 5. So this actor was in two episodes of this and the follow-up movie for this. He was in Captain Power, which was a children's show sci-fi series that JMS, the creator of uh, Babylon 5, did work on beforehand. And we've seen some actors from that pop up. It's been a while, actually, since we've done the spotlight and had to mention Captain Power, but this actor seemed to impress uh, the cast and crew there and brought him back uh, all these years later. So that's really nice because that happens often with B5 where someone that they worked with uh, a decade earlier, they're like, hey, I remember that they were very good. Let's bring them in. And I, I, I really do appreciate that sense of community that B5 still had even in this era of, of, of things. But uh, Luke, was there anything that you knew this actor from? He's Canadian after all. So maybe there's some local uh, series or movies that you're familiar with and we're not. I saw he was Canadian and I looked at his uh, IMDb and like he's definitely been in a whole bunch of stuff. And like Murdoch Mysteries is probably the one that jumps to mind. But I think there was also, it's not Heartland, but it's like a precursor to that, which is like a show about horses or something. But I've seen none of I've seen none of it. I so I also was just like, oh, maybe I've like I probably seen something he's in because he's a real working actor, done a lot of work both in LA and then up in Canada. So I, I thought we might have crossed paths with my viewing habits, but unfortunately, I had not seen anything he'd done before. I knew, I knew, I knew of some of it, but that's that's the most I can say See, for him. Unfortunately, great career though, man. He's been working nonstop. Learning the ropes where he plays Chad Hunk. <laughs> 
Chad Hunk. I mean, sounds great. Should we watch it? Did he learn the ropes, Rachel? Did he learn the ropes? Tell me. I don't know what that is. I don't is. know. I haven't seen it. Now, can you answer this for me, Luke? So there's a trivia fact on his IMDb that relates to a series that's, I think, ongoing in Canada called Gourmet Mysteries. What is that? Do you know what this is? Have you heard of this? He's in this thing called Gourmet Never Mysteries. Never heard of it. <laughs> And the trivia on IMDb is he keeps getting horrifically injured in some weird way every time he shoots it. I don't know, like, every time he does a new episode, he gets injured in some way. And then I looked up, his wife writes gourmet mysteries. Like, she writes this show and the little TV movies for it. It's like an ongoing thing. Now, I don't think he's the lead guy in it, but he keeps reappearing. And I'm like, what is this? And it looks like he's just some, I think it's just some Canadian like mystery show i don't know what it i don't know what it is every time i go pressing gourmet mysteries it wouldn't really give me a clean answer and i'm like well maybe the 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 canadian could tell us if this is a a show that's like popular there like oh yeah this is like corner gas for us like i don't know (laughs) no 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 uh it's uh, i looked i saw that too my best guess based on what i saw of it it looks like it's kind of like a hallmark style sort of thing i would bet it's probably a cable network that does um a lot of like probably a lot of Christmas movies during Christmas, and this probably is what they fill out the rest of the year with. Uh, that would be my best bet, like um, which we shoot a lot of. Canada shoots a lot of Christmas movies for Hallmark. It, it looks like it falls right into that genre. Um, so um, my bet would be that. So I'm sure I'm sure there's like W or Hallmark Channel or someone has commissioned a bunch of these oh. things. Oh no, it's a Hallmark. So Rachel, it is a whole. It's no on net uh, network is it's. Like broadcast on Hallmark movies and mysteries. Detective Price, off duty. A dream vacation turns into a nightmare. Now it's a race against time to catch a killer. I just need 24 hours. With a recipe for murder. I tasted the saline in her drink. A Hallmark movies and mysteries original. Dylan Neal, Brooke Burns, Gourmet Detective, A Healthy Place to Die. On Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. He was in Dawson's Creek. He was in like 20 episodes of Dawson's Creek. Mm -hmm. He was in The L Word. Oh, okay. Uh, He was in Arrow. Yes. Yes, he was in Arrow. It was Arrow or The Flash. I can't remember. He was in one of the... Yeah, he's like an ongoing character and that is like 10, 15 episodes. Yep, he was in Bones. Oh, do you have a Bones story? Rachel Luke is a big Bones head. She loves Bones, the That's show. I love not... the Minbari so much. She loves Bones physically too. <laughs> uh, no, he's in like one of the best episodes of Bones. Holy shit. Cool. Think, is, think, he like, the, it, is he the it, Bones? It, wow, that's a it, real like, it, feather in his cap. It was one of those ones where it was just like, this is very, very clearly Emmy, babe, but it's actually pretty good. Hey, if it's going for Emmys, um, that's something for Bones. Yeah. <laughs> Bones did occasionally do it. So the, the plot of this is that they, they find this body and it's just like Brennan's decided that she believes in the idea of teamwork now. So she gets all of her squin, like five of her squin turns together to stop, solve this c- case. Could I so- stop you there? You're saying a lot of phrases like we should know what these mean. Squin turns is what Rachel said. It's just going to keep walking right past. What they call the interns? Why don't they call them interns, Rachel? They're adding they, more letters to it. If you know, it. you know. Yeah, that's they it. You know, squint. You know. Oh, okay. Thank you. So her squin turns. Yep. It's like a hybrid because, uh, like, uh, Booth originally called them all, like, the squints. And obviously Bones called them, like, you know, the interns or by their thing. So then it, like, merges in the show. Okay. Um, But they find a body and they realize that the injuries were, like, and time of death and stuff confirm that these were from... 9-11. (laughs) Nine eleven. <laughs> Jesus, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't ex- I didn't expect nine eleven to <laughs> pop on up. I was gonna wonder if we should bring Caught 9-11. You off guard. I didn't I, I was actually wondering if we should bring up nine eleven because this is the first B five thing post nine eleven. Yeah. That that's it's okay with uh the good guys torturing. Oh it, it aged well. Yep. Um and then they like was he one of the perpetrators or a victim? 
Oh, the bones? It's okay. like the um, part of like the mystery and, you know, they're trying to uncover things and uh, Dylan Neal plays one of like the higher ups that Booth used to know and he goes to information. Oh, so for. he's like a CIA guy. FBI um, guy or whatever. Military, yeah. Military guy, soldier man. Um, Booth was in the Navy, so it would be... A Marine. Yeah. <laughs> sure. He's an admiral, in fact. Okay, that's interesting. I know he was in Sabrina, the Teenage Witch. Yes. He was a big character in that. Uh-huh. He was a love interest for Sabrina. They married. No. Right? Or oh, fiancé, fiancé. Fiancé. They didn't I marry. I fucking hate Aaron. <laughs> Ooh. It, like, so... It, it is not a problem with his performance. His character is supposed to be awful, right? No. No? Okay. No. No. It's because... It, so, like, um, at this point, like, the show starts with, like, Harvey and Sabrina are endgame. Of course. Right? I've seen television. I know how it works. Ross and Rachel. Go From on. the fucking pilot. And then, you know, eventually they're like, well... Harvey can't be in the show anymore because we can't do any more relationship drama and for it to make any sense. So he just kind of leaves the show mostly, but pops back in occasionally. And Sabrina dates all of these other boys. As a TV get. show about a teenage girl would do. Yep. Um, and by this point, she's in her early 20s because it goes through like high school and college for mm-hmm. her. Because uh, it's like seven seven seasons, I think. Um, so he's not the worst boyfriend that she has, uh, but she's clearly not into him the same way that he's into her. Oh, and he thinks <laughs> like I found my college sweetheart, and. We can tackle anything together, uh, and she's like, like the whole time. And you hate, just like, and you hate him. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'm gonna be honest. I sound like I hate Sabrina right oh, now. I, he, I, he sounds like I a hate, great, I hate he, what she does. Too. He sounds like a great guy. He is a great guy. Wow, and he, he is a great him. guy. I hate him because he doesn't stand up for himself enough. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. I, like, I, I hate him because he, he's so frustrating because he's just so perfect. Whoa, 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 okay, now that I understand. I was going to say, are you telling me that this guy, a guy who previously was known for playing a character with hunk in their name, was a spineless guy who couldn't stand up for himself? That's hard to believe, but now but you're saying because he's too nice. He's, like, he's not spineless. Like, he's just, he's so understanding. Like, a part, like I watched part he is, of the then clip. He, he truly is Canadian then. Yeah. He's so polite. Like, they are at their fucking wedding. At their wedding. At the altar. I'm going to let that slide. I'm going to let that slide because I want to know more about how you know what it's like to be a per- so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't don't connect with that. Um, they are at the altar. She's in her dress, and I can't remember who it is, but somebody's like holding up her veil. <gasps> no, to hide their faces as they have this conversation. Because <laughs> it's Sabrina. It's a silly show. It's a show yeah. where the time wizard yeah, has a big like, clock. Just like, oh wait, do you need a moment? And then it's just like, just pop up the veil to like. Make a privacy screen. <laughs> Which cracking Rachel up still to this day. <laughs> and he's it's just like, Luke up even. like he's just like you don't you don't really want to get married, do you? And she's just like, like I love you so much. But no. And then she whispers, and You're she, not endgame. And he's just kind of like, Well, I I, I do deserve better, so I kind of <gasps> get it. And uh, like in this episode, she's like hunting down the other half of her soul stone, which like confirms that Aaron is her soulmate. Oh my god, he is her soulmate! <laughs> no, she's trying to confirm that because she's uh, got cold feet. Oh no! And she finds it, and they don't. <laughs> oh, that's good, I guess. He's too polite. So he's just like, you, you're gonna go after Harvey, aren't you? And she's just like, whoop. 
Maybe definitely. Oh, I can't it. Y- it's, it's, yeah. end, it's end game. Oh, uh, and then she runs out. Oh no! And two Harvey gets on the back of the motorcycle and ends the show. Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. Harvey's soul stone drops, and then they merge perfectly. And yet you hate this guy for being oh. like a great guy. He, he sticks around so long. He's like he in ten episodes, a- by the way. <laughs> But you know, like you know what they're doing, and I just had no patience for his character because I'm like, get the fuck out of here! Like I had the stronger reaction to get him out of the show than like a protagonist you have with a protagonist in a horror movie. I was just like, you deserve better. <laughs> I fucking hate that you're here because it was. It's also really padding time. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna be bold. Justice for Aaron. <laughs> Justice for Aaron. He did nothing wrong. He's my boy. I'm. I'm. He's my favorite character. Fuck Harvey. He sucked. By the way. No. Justice for Aaron. What I was mean, his last name? His last name. <laughs> Douglas. I don't know. I love Aaron now. Luke's an Aaron fan. I've Aaron heard him. Jacobs. Aaron Jacobs. Um, Luke said, "I got to rep the Canadian boy. We're big Canadian fans yeah, here." Like, like, but that's why I like. I have an irrational hatred for that character. Did you recognize him? Yes. Oh, and I had a similar thing. Of I was just like, "You are handsome, man," and I don't like you. Why don't I like you? There's no reason for me to not really like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I twigged. <laughs> so Babylon Five fans do tend to like this guy. He has appeared at several conventions. He is someone that has. Uh, interacted with the fan base, uh, people tend to like him. He just seems like a genuinely good yeah, person. Like, interacts really well I with people. Tells so many fun. He tells many fun stories about his encounters with sci-fi like, fans. Everything's like he's accomplished at this and accomplished at that, and well regarded in the community. Even though he, like the professional community, and but he hasn't won any awards. You were more passionate talking about Sabrina than this movie. <laughs> You better give this movie a yum. It's a yum. Yum. Yeah, it's a yum. It's it's a yum. It's a yum. Yum. This right. conversation should be fairly quick. Ryan, what is it for you? Well, he did say it's a yum. It's a yum. So is it just yum twice? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I nobody, nobody. I don't think is giving this a yum yum. Well, well, well. Here I am. Contrarian. Bitch. Here we go. I'm going to give this the biggest, fattest, moistest yum. Yeah. What's next for Babylon Five? The series was done. It wrapped up its story. Then it had a movie to lead in to a spin-off series. The spin-off series got cancelled before it aired. Then the episodes were aired out of order, and it's not very good and it makes no sense. Then we had Legend of the Rangers to be the next chance for the Babylon 5 universe to live. Then it died for many years. What happened after that? What was the next opportunity? How come Babylon 5 kept getting so many opportunities? Well, we have The Lost Tales. Babylon 5, The Lost Tales, Wednesday at 7 p.m. KSA on Super Movies. This movie is in association with Pepsi. Dare for more. Ten years after he became president of the Interstellar Alliance, John Sheridan returns to Babylon 5 for the IA's anniversary celebration when a techno-mage shows him a glimpse of a future Earth destroyed in a devastating Centauri assault and a demonic entity makes itself known closer to home. The stakes are raised with billions of lives in the balance. In Voices in the Dark, series creator J. Michael Straczynski reunites with stars Bruce Boxleitner, Tracy Scoggins, and Peter Woodward in two richly imagined stories set after... (laughs) Rachel's scowling at me, I'm sorry. I'm literally biting my tongue. In two richly imagined stories set (laughs) after the events of Babylon 5. Ooh, aren't you excited, Rachel? I hope they say what happened with no. the hand. Of, set after the events of the original series, in one, a supernatural force 
penetrates Babylon 5 on a mission whose success or failure will devastate or redeem whole planets. In the other, Sheridan must make a decision to take or save one life. A decision that will result in either the salvation or destruction of Earth herself. <laughs> it's a lost tales. It's a lost tales. Hey, hey, Luke, 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 Luke. If you thought Babylon 5 with this one had a bit of a wonky budget, wait till you see the Lost Tales where every environment, well, 90% of the environment is nothing but green screens. Ooh, and nothing says great, great. I have seen, I have seen clips of the Lost Tales. It looks insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a tech damage in it. Played by Edward Woodward's son, Peter Woodward. So there you go. And he was- Now a- let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a quick question. Please do. Were techno majors a thing prior yes. to this? Yes, <laughs> they were. They were in an episode, and in an episode, and then they were. He, Peter Woodward's character was a lead in Crusade. So this is the Lost Tales is basically uniting Crusade and Babylon Five together for what was hopefully going to be sparking off many future adventures of little stories that were Lost Tales in Babylon Five. It didn't work out that way. Oh. Oh, they're going to link Crusade and Babylon 5, but they're not going to link Legends of the nope. Rangers? Seems, nope. seems like cherry Because Crusade was already linked up with B5, and then, then it got cancelled, and now they're going to... But it's not like you get a conclusion to what happened in Crusade. It's just one of the characters is here, too. Like, the fan-favorite character from Crusade is in this, because Galen, the techno mage, is a fan-favorite. People like him. I, I like him, even. So we will be talking about the Lost Tales, a, 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 a thing that we have said from the beginning... We fear because it's a sad note to end our podcast on of Babylon 5, where for years we've been doing this. And then it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, we'll end on The Lost Tales, the saddest entry of Babylon 5. A word to use? Pathetic. So can't oh, wait I to see. I was going to go with shot. <laughs> uh, can't wait to see if maybe my expectations have gotten in the way of true quality. Maybe. What? They are better. Maybe the Lost Tales are better than what I saw when I watched it as a child all of those years ago. I've never rewatched it before. So maybe my analytical brain mm-hmm. will find some merit in these tales that have been lost. So cannot yeah, wait. And may- maybe they were right to use the atomic bomb. Oh, Rachel, you haven't watched the Lost Tales and you don't know how relevant that <laughs> statement is. So hold on to it with your sweet dear life. Uh, Luke, we're wrapping it up now. I'm so scared. could you I'm tell scared. everyone more about your podcast, where you can be found? What's happening in the future? You said you're on a hiatus. Are you guys coming back? I please come back. I miss having you guys talk about shit shows and suffering through it with a big grin. Oh, suffering is the name of the game, that's for sure. Uh, we're probably coming back. We're working on it right now. I think we'll probably be back in a few months here. But uh, in the meantime, we have like an obscene number, like 200 plus episodes. You can get those at continuumdrag.podbean.com or really anywhere you get podcasts. Just search Continuum Drag and there's a huge back catalog. Uh, so much back catalog now. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll be, we'll be, Finding our way back, maybe with a, some some format tweaks sometime in the next couple of months. That's for sure. Uh, but there'll be more more weird sci-fi TV to be found out there. It, it, it turns out to be a bottomless well. Oh, it never ends, and they make new ones. So you can always keep uh, as your show ages. There'll always be new things to to uh, pick apart. But you guys have your social medias. Your I know you're on Twitter and Instagram, and you always post interesting stuff when the podcast is active that relate to episodes. I really like your your posts. You have little videos or random little tidbits of things. So really great time. Uh, so- yeah, yeah. I was thinking... Sorry, I was just going to say, I was thinking if if this if we had watched Legends of the Rangers for uh, our podcast, I would have 100% been pulling clips of that uh, woman sh- punch fighting uh, spaceships because that was exactly what I always post is like the weirdest, funniest VFX stuff. And that was, was prime. It was prime stuff. It's prime real estate. Now we can be found on social medias under Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. We are on all of those podcatchers as well. So make sure to uh, follow along, subscribe so you get these episodes as they come out. 
Also, check out our YouTube channel. There's some content on there that can't make it to the audio-based feeds, so you should go over there. We've been having interviews with cast members from Space Above and Beyond, where you can get the video uh, of that, as well as just the audio of it on your podcatchers. But uh, we're trying to grow the YouTube channel a bit, and it has been doing very well. And, Rachel, how do people contact us if they want to hit us up more directly, if they're saying no... I actually love Legend of the Rangers and I want to email you. What do they do? If, uh, yeah, I was going to say if they want to contact us and they don't want to pay for the privilege, uh, emailing is the way to go and that would be at yumyumpod at gmail.com. And if you don't ma- mind, if you don't mind, uh, you can check out the Patreon where you will get access to a private Discord. We have a Patreon where we... And Rachel, real quick. Oh, yeah. What, what's Ryan's phone number for uh, the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Very Just sweet. in case they want to give him a call. Uh, <laughs> fun fact. Uh, uh, I, I Luke's, think I have mentioned uh, on the pod that I don't know Ryan's phone number by heart. Nor do I know <laughs> Rachel's, but I can tell you what Jukar's comment about Swedish meatballs is all about. And that when they refer to the one, they're referring to the previous main character who went back in time and became Jesus of the Minbari. But that's a story for another time, Well, that's only a third of it. That's only a bit of it. There's three people who are the one. (laughs) And also the person, the old wise man that once said, uh, we live for the one, we die for the one. He's was a very kooky alien. A very always... silly alien character that the fans and I adore very much called Zathras. And he always spoke in the third person. And then we revealed he has nine brothers all played by the same actor. And they all are called Zathras, but with slightly different inflections on how you say it. Mm-hmm. But, but it sounds identical. You cannot hear the difference, yeah. Yeah. So that's what that's about. But uh, yeah, we have a Patreon. We upload bonus content there. Some of it doesn't make it to the main feed. We're talking Doctor Who. We're talking Star Wars. We're talking through The Expanse. We're watching it for the first time. Mm-hmm. We are going that through. We're past the halfway point. The main feed but we are like there's so much there's so much so, so much more on uh, Patreon. reward yourself by joining the Patreon and it's a uh, grand old it. time you, des- you deserve we deserve it you deserve it everyone deserves a, an extra win-win. heaping of yum yum uh, on your on your skin so that is all now uh, Luke with the original pilot film called The Gathering for uh, Babylon 5 Jakar who was in that too by the way uh, Jakar's the one character that has remained for you, huh? Isn't that interesting? When you did Mind War, he was in it, and then he was in this. There was no other characters from Babylon 5 in this, so... Yeah, j- he's my only contact point. <laughs> he's not even the one that you guys were interested in. You were like, you guys were like, I want to see that Londo guy, he seems fun. And then we just keep giving you non-Londo-based stories. But... Jakar in hey, the Jakar's won me over now. Jakar is great. Uh, in the TV movie pilot, The Gathering, his farewell, like the non farewell, which never carried through into the show, was to bang his chest and say "good eating" to you. That was his Correct, farewell. You, oh my, it's thump. He thumps his chest thumps. with his fists and says "good eating" to you, and it never carried into the no, show. But, but we say it all the time. You. We say it all the time, and I say it to you now. Good eating to you, Luke. No, oh, well, thank you. Good eating to you as well. Thanks for having me back. Good eating to you, Rachel. Oh, good eating to you both. Remember, we live for the one, we die for the one. We live young. I'm not agreeing we to that. You agreed to it when you joined the Rangers, mister. We're not turning the car around just for you to get out now. 